Praise God, we're hot. Microphone's on. Camera's running. Let's get the Spirit of God in here tonight. Amen.
Churches, the Mitchells, the Moraleses, the Galvans, and then the Cassios, and uh, let's also pray for Evangelist Chris and Paula Hart this evening. Amen. God's hand upon their service this evening. Altars filled. Let's pray for their families to be blessed. Uh, jobs for the unemployed. Let's wish the best for them and believe God. Amen. For miracles to them. Paul and Linda Campbell in Cape Cod. Let's pray for. The Ganeers, as they assist, let's pray for Pastor Pastor Dave uh, and Benita Suspansky and uh, the Spicers and the Kings and those who labor in the Northeast. Let's also pray for Keith and Carrie Sullivan, God's hand upon the Rochester Church, and then all their new converts baptized in the Holy Ghost. <coughs> and let's pray for miracles uh, to occur here in Greece, uh, families to be saved. Amen. Let's pray for. Uh, miracles, addictions to be broken. Let's pray for uh, divorce to be broken. Let's pray for God to, to come down in this service tonight to anoint us with power, amen, as we serve God, as we worship him together. We're going to pray for some local needs here in Greece. Aaron, Dylan, and Wendy, let's pray for Morrow, who lives in the complex over here. God's hand to be upon him, bring conviction. Let's pray for Kyle and Joe DiPaolo. Amen. Mario and Jovan. Amen. Miracles to these who uh, perhaps are watching online right now. Know that we are praying for you. We're praying for your family. We're praying for breakthrough. Miguel Nieves and Leon Fuller. We're going to lift up our police, first responders, our active military. Let's pray for our veterans. Let's believe God to encourage and strengthen and overshadow them, their families, and all their pursuits. We're going to pray for a young lady by the name of Juanita tonight. Amen. Perhaps you have a need in your life that is not mentioned. I'm going to ask you to lift your hands so we can pray with you. And believe God. God sees your hands. Amen. And when we get God involved, amen, anything is possible. God is the God of miracles. And God will accomplish his precious will. Let's pray for our friends and uh, our fellowship throughout the earth, amen, for God to uh, show up and move. Perhaps we didn't win the elections or your party didn't win or uh, your district didn't win and you're uh, kind of bumming out from what happened last week, but God's in control. God's on the throne and God's going to help us. God's going to uh, help uh, the uh, Christian effort. People are going to be getting saved, even in dark times, even when things are impossible. We have a God who is in charge. Amen. And we're going to call out to him tonight. Let's pray together as a church. Amen. You lift up your brothers and sisters in Christ here. And you pray if you're at home and believe God for this congregation to flourish. We're going to ask David to open us up in prayer. Let's pray, church. Amen. God, you're an awesome God. You can do these things. These are nothing. Nothing's too hard. Nothing's too difficult. We're trusting in you for the miraculous, God. We're believing you. God, just show up in this service, Lord God. Give us convictions. Help us to grow. Help us to know you will, God. Help us to change, God. We pray for Pastor Keith and Carrie Sullivan, Lord God. We're believing you to move in all the new church plants, God, throughout the earth, God. We're praying for the upcoming conference in January, Lord God, for miracles to occur, for refreshing by the Holy Ghost to every ministry, to every church leader. God, I pray for Pastor Greg to get the mind of God for those that are preaching and ministering there, Lord God. God, we believe you, God, for miracles. Break divorce, break addictions and drugs and alcohol, Lord God, all perversion to cease, God. We speak against principalities and rulers and every idol and every 
a worshiper of <coughs> idols right now, and we contend for the miraculous. We lift up the blood of Jesus, and you break the chains, and you come down here tonight, God, you help us in this service. Lord, we know in these precious. dark times that uh, Jesus, us glows brighter than ever. Son of a living yeah, God, Lord, that you Son of a Lord, to us, to you, so that people can come to you, it's almost too late. Yes. So we ask that you trust the people so that they come to know you. Precious. And put it all in your God hands. Because we know we can't do it without you. Bring every word to pass. Hallelujah. Let's pray, amen, and believe God together. Amen. Why don't we take a minute to greet one another, make everybody feel welcome? Praise God. Welcome to Grease Potter's House if you're online. Amen. I'd like to shake your hand, but I can't. I'd like to give you a fist pump, maybe an air pump. How's that? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah here at Grease Potter's House. We want to welcome you if you're online. A few announcements. If you're not aware, we have Sunday morning service at 1030. Praise the Lord. At uh, 630 at night, we have our evening service. And there's prayer an hour before our service. And we trust in the living God. We're going to also be in church on Wednesday nights till Jesus returns at 730. Amen. 630 is our prayer. Let's believe God together. Amen. For outreach on this Saturday, we'll be going door to door. If it warms up, probably not. No, it's Saturday. There's going to be a snowstorm. So you pray for us as we go to the mall or wherever we go. You're welcome to join us too. If you can't join us because of some physical uh, limitation, then uh, you can pray for us and believe God that we connect with people. Let them know the good news and uh, share our testimony with them. It's exciting. It's always exciting to be knocking on doors and talking to people about Jesus. It's a privilege to be an evangelical Christian, to go out into all the world as Jesus commanded us. And one of the commands uh, that Jesus gave, amen. And we're thankful that you're here tonight. We're going to uh, take up our offering right now. This is from Exodus 6, verses 1 through 4. Uh, it's called, The land of Canaan was promised again. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let the people go. 
and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but my name of Lord was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them. That's a promise. That's a legal and binding decree that God has spoken to his people to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. Amen. They took a little detour. You and I can take detours in life. But God promises you and I financial <coughs> dominion. Amen. And they didn't have it, obviously, when they were slaves in Egypt. But God said, I'm bringing you out. And I'm bringing you to the promised land. Amen. God doesn't get any glory out of you uh, going bankrupt or getting more credit cards. He wants to prosper you and bless you and help you. But you're going to have to learn how to give. You have to learn how to surrender. And God's going to take care of all of your temporal needs because he's a good God. Can anybody say amen? amen? He's a good God. And he will meet every last one of your needs according to his riches and glory. Let's give to God out of hearts of appreciation. Uh, brother, can you come forward and take the offering? God loves a cheerful giver. We're not being forced to do this. Amen. God is helping <coughs> us. Let's believe God this year to become self-supporting as you and I give to the work. Amen. Let God be glorified. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give. And we thank you for the way that you care for us. Yes. That you always care for us. And make yes, sure that we have our daily bread and what we need. That's right. We give back to you just out of joy and thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for your giving. Amen. You can click the link online. King of kings and Lord of lords. verses 4 through 6 in a moment here. I got interested in a documentary about uh, North Korea at Kim Il-sung Square in central Phnom Penh. Groups of about 100 people wait their turn then climb up the steps leading to the 20 meter tall bronze statues of the first leader, the eternal president, Kim Il-sung, and his successor, his son, Kim Jong-il, at the feet of the two statues, they then bow in unison. Then, after they're done bowing, actually they pay for flowers, you've got to pay some money for a bouquet, and then you bring the bouquet up and you lay them at the feet of this bronze statue, after you're done doing that respectfully, uh, then you, you move along and another group comes along and they pay homage or worship. Pyongyang is the top capital city of North Korea. And worshiping here, a few blocks away, thousands have gathered for mass dancing to celebrate 
the birthday of Kim Jong-il. One of the most interesting things I discovered a few years ago was uh, what they're teaching their young people that Kim Jong-il loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, Kim Jong-in. Kim Jong-un is not the savior. Does anybody realize that in here? <laughs> He's not. But they would have you believe that and through their propaganda, they are completely missing the right one to worship. Amen. Let's read our scripture. Daniel 3, verse 4. Then a herald cried aloud to you it is commanded, O peoples and nations and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whosoever who does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Amen. I've entitled this, Do Not Bow. Amen. We understand that the Jewish boy's religion did not allow them to bow to any other God except for Yahweh. Him alone they were supposed to worship. There was not supposed to be any graven images of gold and silver and wood or stone. They were to worship the living God. Amen. It was not allowed in their religion. No other graven images. But King Nebuchadnezzar, in his pride and arrogance, he builds a Great 90 foot high statue, nine feet wide, an image of himself. And the head was made of pure gold. Nebuchadnezzar, verse 3, the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits high and width of six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word and gathered together the satraps. The administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, all the important people, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up and erected in his own honor. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, and all these important people, and all the officials of the provinces is gathered together for the <coughs> dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You have the present day dictator Kim Jong-un. His father Kim Jong-il and uh, the grandfather who's uh, in charge of everything who's also considered the eternal president of the country all three of these are immortal. Kim Il Sung, who went to power right after the Korean War, and they, they're still at war. They haven't even signed a peace treaty. It's just a ceasefire right now. North and South Korea. I'd like to preach tonight, especially about conviction. Knowing what you believe in is critical for your success. And without it, you will wander. You will be like a leaf blowing in the wind. You will be tossed to and fro with strange doctrines. You will never make any solid connection to the living God. Amen. We have to learn who are we are, who is who we are worshiping. Amen. Are we worshiping the living God, or are we worshiping this world? Are we worshiping? The devil, or are you worshiping yourself? Which is even worse. Christians don't worship any pictures. You see, we have no idols in here. We have no crosses or crucifixes or statues or anything like that. 
Jesus taught the a woman at the well. He said, there's going to come a time when you will not worship in Samaria. You're not going to worship in Jerusalem. You can worship anywhere in God's nature, in God's earth. Because God is a spirit. And God desires to be worshipped in spirit and truth. So let's look first at the need. And that is the need for us to stick to our convictions. What we believe. It's very difficult to uh, live a Christian life in a godless society without convictions. You need to make up your mind what is right, what is wrong. If you don't have any convictions, then you will be tempted and tempted easily. Look at me, uh, look with me, excuse me, at Matthew 4 8. Because the temple, the the devil even tempted Jesus. He said, bow down to me and I'll give you everything. One of the three temptations. While Jesus was fasting for 40 days in the desert, a temptation to bow and bow down before the devil. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory in an instance. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, verse 10, away with you, Satan. For it is written... You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And the devil left him and beheld, uh, excuse me, the angels came and ministered to Jesus. He stood up against the devil. Why? Because he knew what was right. He knew that he wasn't supposed to worship him. He knew that the entire earth was supposed to be worshiping God, the living God. We need to have something in place of eternal value this evening that will protect us in those times when we are weakened. Maybe there's a failure in your life. Maybe you're uh, tempted to backslide. Maybe you're uh, online and you're being drawn away by strange people you don't even know. You're being tempted. But without any convictions, you will fall into sin very easily. Without any convictions, you go use drugs. You go drink, you'll go party with your buddies and you'll lose your salvation. You'll be tempted to bow down. We need something inside of us, like a backbone you could say, a rod, a steel rod that would help us to not bow down Amen. That is from heaven right there. That just came to me. You need a, a, a conviction working inside of you so that you would not bend over. That's another way of saying it, I guess. We need to have something in our character of value that's going to keep us. Something in our makeup. An eternal valuing system that we can see, no, that's stupid, that's fleshly, or that's carnal, that's a waste of time, that's immoral. And this over here, this is godly, forgiving those people, uh, standing against false doctrines. You know, th th there's, there's got to be something inside of you that helps you to make those decisions and that will stick with you and help you, will carry you throughout the days uh, and the weeks that you have here on earth till you finally take your turn in the... Uh, you know, the wooden casket or, or in that urn and your ashes will be there. There'll be no more time to make decisions. There'll be no more temptations. And everything, uh, your future destiny will be sealed in heaven because there'll be no more time. You'll be dead. You need something that guides us. Some people liken it to a moral compass. Something inside of you and I that shows us what is north, right? And what is south west and east, and gives us direction how we can travel in this Christian journey. Amen. Where to go, where not to go, where to head. When God says, 
Go left, do you turn right? We need a moral compass. Hallelujah. So we don't get off track and make the wrong turns and wind up another statistic. Or we wind up in the wilderness as the children of Israel. Wasting time, wasting money, wasting energy. Years, 40 years. They, their moral compass was busted. We need that. We need to have something. I know some people who have had incredible miracles happen in their life. Outstanding things. And because their compass or their convictions were not in place, they decide to go away from God, get out of His will. You know that thing that's inside you that corrects you. You know, and you're Driving to a certain location, you have your GPS, and the lady's voice comes out. Uh, you know, you made a wrong turn. Uh, now you're going to make a different path, and you hear that voice. And we need in our conscience to have a, a direction, a, a voice to, of wisdom to give us a, a way to go, a way to act, a way to think. It blows my mind how people so quickly forget the will of God. And they get out of his will. They're ungrateful for God's grace. He's done miracles, outrageous things. And yet it's not important anymore. This is why they have a, they're missing the conviction. They are no longer uh, here. They no longer believe properly. Why? Because in daily living, they have been told to bow down. Right? Bow down to money. Bow down to recreation. Bow down to your own will. Bow down to this world system. Bow down. Amen. Look at Romans 12 too. Because we're talking about you forming convictions. Romans 12 too talks about the pressure that the world is going to put on you. As a young child or as a teenager, you... Uh, you have your friends, your peer pressure, and that doesn't quit after you uh, turn 20. You're still being pressured and conformed, and the world is still trying to chip away at you and shape you and mold your mind to think a certain way. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are called as Christians to not be shaped by this world, by the system. We're being pressed and conformed into its image, into its ideas, and they are taping, taking root inside of us. We're called as Christians to let the word of God shape us. We're called as Christians to let the scriptures teach us and train us and make us into who we need to be for Jesus. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Creating convictions inside our hearts so that when there are treacherous waters, when we are sailing in uncharted uh, oceans and there's you know the waves are bellowing and there's all kinds of storminess around us we need to know how we can sail through it we need to know how to deal with it in making difficult decisions we need to have our minds renewed amen there's hope for your mind your mind is like plastic the scientists are telling us and they can uh those grooves that have been worn into the vinyl of your soul can be changed, amen. They can be melted. You can be thinking. You can be renewed. You can be changed even at the age of 57 or whatever you are. If you're a little kid, amen, God can train you and teach you and help you to think, amen, and think the right way. We need to have our minds renewed so that when we are confronted with Satan 
and his agenda when we are confronted by this world and then we have something inside of us. When we are confronted with bizarre cultural shifts, new ideas about sexuality, new teachings and doctrines about morality, that we have a foundation, a bedrock of our thinking. Our lives are built upon a rock and not upon shifting sand so that uh, when the troubles come, we are solid. We know where we are building our lives on Jesus. We can rely on God's timeless word. The foolish builders build on the sand. Jesus taught, whoever hears my words and puts them into practice, he is like a, a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against his house. Yet it did not fall. For its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus teaches and puts them, and doesn't put them into practice, he is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, the shifting sands of fads and passing doctrines that the world is trying to show you is what you can build your life on. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it's Ruin was great. It fell with a great crash. There's always a pr pressure to conform. All of us. Just because everybody's doing it does not make it right. I hear that mantra from young people all the time. That's old fashioned. <laughs> that doesn't work. You need to uh, figure out who God wants you to be. That's all. Figure out who God wants you to be and then become that person. That's what you need to do. Be the leader to change your generation. Be the leader, be a godly man and a godly woman. And don't be a follower. Don't follow these people that are like, what are they call lemmings? Like those little animals? Is it a lemming? Lemming. Those guys that jump off a cliff and they're just <clears throat> stupid like the pigs Millions of them. Yep. the road is narrow that leads to everlasting life but the road is wide that leads to death amen we have to choose we have to make that decision and not do what everybody else is doing can you say amen Enough. and the opposite is true you think about people in your life that are good people in your, maybe in your school or on your job or, or in your neighborhood, they're good people. And they, or they go to your church, perhaps. <coughs> they're faithful. They have wisdom. They have an honor. Uh, you can follow them. That would be somebody to follow. Amen. Your friends. Amen. There may be people you should avoid. And uh, God will show you. As you pray, God will show you which people uh, you need to follow. Now look at the friends, uh, Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were the three young men who, in our story we're going to see, that they reject the command to bow. They were friends. Think about your friends. You have godly friends that will help you to make good decisions. Godly friends that will influence you and help you to stand up against the evil that, that's so pervasive in our society. We need to make up our minds about certain issues so that when we are confronted with that reality, we can have more than just an opinion, but we have a driving force that moves us and helps us to make those choices, those decisions. You know, those things uh, that, you know, that are in the scripture that say, obviously, you know, time tested. These are important. These are things you need to understand are evil. Adultery is evil. That means sleeping with somebody who's married to somebody else. Or if you're married, that's adultery. That is sin. That is 
wicked. Murder is wrong. These are simple convictions that are tried and true throughout eternity. You have to believe these things. And immorality. And then there's current issues that come up in our society. You see them uh, portrayed on the media. They're pushed through. Uh, they're uh, found in the school system. I was asked today, what are my pronouns? I said, what do you think? There are certain things that are going on in our society, like transgenderism, or abortion, murdering babies in the womb, or pedophilia, or pornography. All these things are very relevant. Do you have an answer to them? What, what, is, your con what is your godly conviction? Your flesh says one thing. Your flesh says, hey, it's cool, man. <laughs> you know, love, peace, and chicken grease. Whatever floats your boat. Have you heard those sayings before? If it's cool with you, it's cool with me. These are obviously wrong phrases, wrong mantras. For the boys in our text who were tested in their faith to find out what they really believed. Hallelujah. It was a matter of life and death. Amen. Because they were forced to make a life and death situation choice. And that was if we disobey our parents and our religion, what we were brought up in, we will be shamed. We will be doing something that is very wrong if we follow through with what the law says. We're going to look at that in a minute also. For you and I to see that it might not be a, a matter of life and death. The government isn't forcing you to do certain <coughs> things. There's no big brother, you know, that's totally, completely in control yet. Yeah. For others, it might be, uh, it might keep you out of a certain job because you're a Christian. You might uh, have a promotion that's coming up on your job and they say, uh, no, we, we can't choose them because, you know, they believe God, they talk about Jesus. And you might lose a job, you might lose an advancement in your company because you have a conviction about certain things. You're not going to do A, B, and C. You're going to do, you know, E, F, and G, let's just say. Amen. There may come a time when the government says you have to believe this way or that way. And if you don't, you will suffer. Like you see in any dictatorship, you have to conform to their politics and follow their propaganda and bow down to their idols, whether it's Stalin, whether it's uh, uh, Hitler, whether it's uh, any of these uh, dictators that are trying to control Kim Jong-un. You have to do what they say. Let's fast forward to the end of the age. Time is over, my friend. You're in the tribulation. All the Christians are gone. You've been left behind. And now, the world leader, otherwise known as the Antichrist, has called you to worship his image. You will be forced to bow down to him or to worship him or pay homage to him and get a mark on your forehead or on your hand if you want to buy or sell. You will be forced to worship him. Book of Revelation, verse 15 and he had power to give life into the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and uh, cause that as many as who would not worship the image of the beast shall be killed. You'll just be eliminated if you find yourself at this time. You will have to worship the Antichrist or pay the consequences, get the guillotine, have your head chopped off. Suffer greatly. And he causes all, both small and great, verse 16, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their forehead. Some identification code will be attached to your worship. And uh, unlike those uh, Mr. T movies about the end of the world and 
revelation, you can't just put a fake coat on you. Or you can't take the coat off once you make up your mind to get it. There's no turning back. That's Bible. You can't buy or sell. If you don't comply with the system, then you will be starving to death or you will be expunged from society. You will be forced out into the wilderness to go and uh, forage for your food. You'll have to live off the land. What's also said is there'll be no Christians to help you, to encourage you. They will be gone. You may have something of, of knowledge in your head about what to do and about the future and how you missed serving God. That's why it's pretty awesome in our story that you have the three boys, they have their friends. And they have each other to help each other make those hard decisions. This end time figure called the Antichrist will grasp all power in his hands and expose and exalt himself against every so-called God or object of worship. He will even <laughs> proclaim himself to be God. Thessalonians 2.4 Like the Caesars of old, he places himself in the role of God and demands worship. You'll have no freedom. That's why I chose to sing that song this evening. There is freedom in the blood of Jesus. There's power. There's everything can be found in Jesus, but you'll have no freedom if you don't serve God. And then you'll be serving in slavery the Antichrist, the devil. You'll be serving somebody who is not God. <coughs> Revelation 13, 4, worshiping the beast. They worship the dragon, i.e. the devil, for giving the beast its power. And they also worship the beast. Who is as great as the beast? They exclaim, who is able to fight against him? This verse provides a stark assessment of religion and spirituality in the end times, the man wrote. The dragon described earlier is Satan. In other words, devil worship will accompany the rise of the beast. But they will also worship the beast. Satan empowers the beast. The worship is a deification of a man. And the worshipers assume that the beast is so powerful, no one can fight against it. That's why we, when we worship, you hear the sound of music. The piano starts tinkling the ivories. It's time to worship the living God. Music ushers in the presence of God. Most dictators rule their people this way into complete submission. You have no opinions. You really don't matter. You have no freedom. They're controlled through propaganda and lies, people will be forced to rat on their neighbors, their own parents, and their children in the end times. Just like they do in uh, Soviet uh, Russia, just like they do in uh, communist uh, North Korea, just like they did in Nazi, uh, in Hitler's time, in Germany. all in the name of patriotism and worshiping their leaders, their dictators. Because they're living under an illusion of success and being rewarded as other people are being turned in. They submit to the dictators by bombing, uh, by uh, reverencing them, whatever they ask. Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, uh, Xi Jinping, Kim Jong-un, Never give in, Winston Churchill said. Never give up the fight. Never bow down. Think where uh, Europe would be without Winston Churchill's ability to encourage the people. In England, they were being bombed daily. There were raids every night. They were being assaulted. He said, never in nothing, nothing great or small, nothing large or petty, never give up in except to the convictions of honor and good sense. This is what helped them through the war. And I want to give you the promise that God will be with you 
these three men, verse 23, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the fiery furnace that Nebuchadnezzar heated up for them. They fell down. You know, you might get knocked down when you're going through this trial or you're being forced to make a choice, a godly moral choice. It might cost you. You might get knocked down. King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. So he rose in haste and spoke to his counselors. Did we not cast these three men bound into the fiery furnace? And he spoke to his counselors. They answered and said, yes, king. But he said, look. Huh. He answered, I see four men walking in the midst of the fire. I see four men loose walking in the midst. They are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. God has promised to be with you. Amen. In your trial, when you make quality choices, everything might be blowing up around you, but Jesus has promised to be with you. Many people say he's like the Son of the God or like a God. Like the Son of God. This is one of the first references, amen, to God having a son. You know in the book of Genesis, it talks about uh, uh, the sons of God. But here specifically, he's talking about one of them. Many believe this is a pre-incarnation of Jesus Christ. How else could they survive that extreme temperature, the heat of that? The soldiers who brought them in were burned up. There had to be something supernatural. Amen. Let's close in looking at obtaining the blessing. Amen. And that's only going to happen to you when you don't bow down. Do not bow. Verse 6, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are times in life when you will be faced with decisions. Maybe they're micro decisions. Maybe they happen, they're little ones here and there, and they sort of shape who you are. But there's also going to be major decisions that you're going to have to make, you're going to have to be ready for on that day that may determine your destiny. It's here, make it or break it. It's now or never. There's going to be things that you face up against that are going to take you one way or the other. These three young men faced death with the commander, King Nebuchadnezzar, bowed down, but they chose not to do it. There will be things that you are confronted with in your life you're going to have to make a godly choice. You're going to have to follow your conscience. And sometimes when you do follow your conscience, there will be a kickback. You have to be ready for that. But in our situation here, we see that Jesus, the Son of God, was there with them to help them and to protect them. So that when they came out of that fire, their clothes didn't even smell. There wasn't any tinge of smoke on them. That's miraculous, and that's what God chooses to do for you. Daniel's friends disobey the king. You have to obey your conscience. If you've got a conscience. If you're still able to make godly choices, and the world hasn't ripped you off. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews they spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree. But there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your God. They do not worship your gold image that you have set up. You see, God shows up and saves them anyways. People are going to rat on you. People are going to uh, talk bad about you. People are going to try to set you up for failure. But God says, no, uh, these, are, these are my children. These are my chosen. Hallelujah. These are men who have conviction. 
and I'm going to help them. God shows up and saves them. He will save you also in that time. Look at the king even praises God. King Nebuchadnezzar, the great immortal king. He went near the mouth of the fiery furnace. He said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out here right now. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, they come out. There was no fire upon them. There was no burning. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected. The Hebrew boys are raised then to prominence. Nebuchadnezzar worshiped God. He makes the law at this point. There's much good that comes out of your godly choices. Don't ever forget that. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel to deliver his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that all people, nation, languages which speak against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made in ash heap because there is no god who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were given higher positions of authority in that kingdom. Who knows what God has for you? Who knows how God can promote you? God really is planning on rewarding you. You don't know it yet. You don't see it perhaps. But when you remain faithful, God rewards and he will help you. I close. First Chronicles 28, 20. David said to Solomon, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord my God is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. That means he will not disappear uh, and, you know, and surprise you. He's not going to leave you. For all the work of the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. First Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted above what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way so you can endure it. Amen. Even if you're not ready for those trials and those temptations, God is so gracious. But I want to encourage you to make your own convictions and be ready for the fiery test fiery trial that will come upon every Christian to prove if you are the real deal <coughs> and never bow down. Praise God. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. I would like to give you an opportunity if you're not a Christian that you would turn your life over to Jesus. You would begin to worship God. You've been brought here tonight or you're online, you're watching, you're listening. God has got your attention. Finally, he wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to give you help. And he wants to become Lord of your life. Amen. He wants you to begin to worship him because he's the king. He's the creator. He is your savior. What I mean by that is that he shed his blood on the cross for your salvation. That the sins that you are committing will not be to your account, but they will be taken off of your life and placed on Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, who died once and for all. Anybody who puts their trust in Jesus will not be turned away, will not be turned out. Amen. Jesus is here today. He wants to save you. He really loves you. and He wants a relationship with you, but you're not saved. Amen. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand if you'd like to get saved. You want to go forward and change your life. You want to have a conviction. You want to put a rod of steel in your back so you don't bow down to that perversion so you don't bow down to that drug anymore so you don't bow down to alcohol you have to have something inside of you to stand up and Jesus will give you that power through his Holy Spirit and God really loves you 
you want to pray and get saved. Maybe you're black, backslidden tonight. You're not right with God. You're not serving him. You're worshiping the devil. You're worshiping yourself or you're just bowing down. God really wants to give you strength and power, but you've got to make that decision tonight. Tonight is a crucial night for you. And that if you let this moment pass, you might never get it again. We're not promised tomorrow. There is an urgency to an altar call. And that is for you to change your life. And you sense God calling you. You want to pray with an uplifted hand. You're not right with God. You're not serving him. Then that's you. Amen. You want to pray. Praise God. Let's go ahead and uh, close the service. Amen. We're going to open up the altars for a moment here. We're going to sing this song one time through. Uh, and then you can consider yourself dismissed. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. You're dismissed.